So, Father, we thank you that you uh, are a consuming fire. And, uh, Lord, this morning I pray that your fire would consume all the false realities that we have constructed. So, I pray that you would deconstruct us, all of us that was built on a lie, and reveal what you have uh, constructed from the foundation of the world. So, Lord Jesus, we offer ourselves to you as an offering, and we pray that you would preach in Jesus' name. Amen. I wore a What Would Jesus Do bracelet in a movie theater once to see if it worked. Guy's cell phone went off, one of those obnoxious rings where it's a song, and he doesn't want to answer it because the good part's coming. <laughs> Then he answers the phone in the theater. What's going on? No, I'm in the movies. This is what I said verbatim. I'm not going to censor myself. Hey, buddy, get off the phone, please. <laughs> this is what he says to me. Shut up and mind your own business, asshole. Ah, now there's trouble in River City. I'm a man. Not much of one, but a man. I will choke you if you are younger, smaller, and preferably white. I had my hands on his neck, and then I saw my bracelet staring right back at me. What would Jesus do? So I lit him on fire and sent him to hell. So, do you laugh, or do, do you cry? Uh, the world laughs, because that's obviously absurd. But maybe we should cry, for that is what we... Uh, the institutional church have taught the world to believe for the, by and large, for the last 1,500 years or so. And it's not funny to those that have actually believed us. It's actually soul-crushing, faith-quenching, debilitating. You know, the name Jesus literally means Yahweh is salvation, Yahashua, or shortened in Aramaic, Yeshua. In the Old Testament, Isaiah writes, Yahweh is my salvation, my Yeshuat, or shortened, uh, Yeshua. Uh, Yahweh is my Yeshua. In the Old Testament, I, I, he writes, uh, uh, Yahweh is my Yeshua. Uh, that's Isaiah 12. Chapter four, 43 through Isaiah, God says this, I, I am Yahweh, and beside me there is no Savior. So he's the only Savior, and he saves us from everything except, of course, himself, because he's the Savior. So when Daniel Tosh says, I'll do what God is salvation does, I'll set him on fire and send him to hell, the world laughs. For the church has taught the world that there is this place of endless torture where people are endlessly not saved. And we call it hell. So we've been telling the world, you must trust God is salvation for salvation because God is salvation, doesn't save, and his name is Jesus. But the gospel is quite literally, simply, quite absolutely, Jesus. God is salvation. That's good news. That's gospel. But, but you see, when we go on to say, if you don't believe the gospel... On the day that your body dies, then you will suffer endless death, pain, and separation from God. We simultaneously say, there actually is no gospel for those that need salvation, for those that actually need saving. For what is it that we need saving from? Our sin. And what's our sin? It's lack of faith in Jesus the Savior. And so belief in hell as endless conscious torment is simultaneously a belief that God is not salvation for the people that need to be saved. So hell, as it's commonly understood, is this like enormous elephant in the in the middle of the room, and the room is called your psyche, or your soul, or our psyche, or our soul. For the last 1,500 years, most theological systems 
have been built around this enormous elephant in the middle of the room, and these systems have prim primarily taken two forms since Augustine, uh, along about the fifth century, when the church was conscripted by the empire. One form argues that God can save all, but God doesn't want to save all. And so, for no merit or demerit of their own, some are chosen, and some are just not chosen. That's normally called Calvinism. It means that God is all-powerful, but he's not all-love. And so, in effect, we're saved by the luck of the draw. In other words, we're saved by chaos rather than logos, uh, the word, the will, and the reason of, of God. Well, the second form, the second form argues that God wants to save all. He really wants to, but he can't. He can't save all. Unless, unless, of course, you choose to be saved, which is quite a problem if bad choices are the very thing that you need to be saved from. That's normally called Arminianism. It means that God is all love, but that God is not power enough to save all, for he decided to create a power more powerful than himself and way less loving than himself, and we sometimes call this power free will, by which we really mean my will. And so, in effect, we each must save ourselves from the judgment of God with what? Our own judgment. Mises rather than Jesus. So I'm, I'm just saying, if you didn't follow that, I'm just saying that for the last 1,500 years, we've built almost all of our thinking about God, that is our theology, around this gigantic elephant in the middle of the room. And check this out. It's an imaginary elephant. And so the elephant didn't mess up the room. We made a mess of the room trying to avoid an imaginary elephant, so terrified of the elephant that we're unwilling to even ask, does it exist? Because it might. And yet it appears that most of the earliest church fathers, the Greek ones, the ones that read the Bible in their native tongue, they didn't seem to believe it existed or that it even could exist. And I've searched the scripture now for 30 years looking for it, and, and I can't find it. In fact, over and over and over and over again, I've found that scripture views this elephant as not only fictional, but impossible. So just as it's impossible for God to lie, because he is the truth, so it's impossible for God to not be salvation, because God is Jesus, salvation, and Jesus is God. But now listen very, very closely. In order for something to, to be saved, in order to save something, that something has to be unsaved for a time, right? If something is never unsaved, how could it be saved? So it's not as if we don't need salvation. It's not as if that's kind of the... That's one way people take it. It's, it's, not, it's not that. And now listen even more closely to this. In most English Bibles, you will find the word hell in several places. It cannot mean unsaved without end. And yet whatever Greek or Hebrew word is behind the word that gets translated hell, you see it's got to mean something. So what does it mean? What does it stand for when you, when you find that in your Bible? Now, people will say, okay, Peter, I've heard this. You've said this. I, I got this. But I listen. I think, nope, we, we don't got it. Um, I barely got it. I better review it. And if we get it, maybe we could share it with the world. So this is what I really want you to get. I wrote it out, okay? So it'd be real simple. Number one, there is no endless conscious Torment, and I chose those words carefully. I'll explain that later sometime. There is no endless conscious torment in Scripture, for there is no thing in Scripture that is without end, except the end, who is salvation. That's Jesus. But, number two, there are three concepts that we refer to as hell, or translate with the English word hell. I call them hell number one, 
That's Hades and Sheol. Hell number two, the eternal fire. And hell number three, uh, Gehenna. So think of hell number one over here. Um, in the ESV, the NRSV, the NIV, most modern English translations, the word hell cannot even be found in all of the Old Testament. However, in the King James Version, hell shows up 31 times in the Old Testament. But the very same word that's translated hell also shows up as the word grave. And that word is sheol. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, a couple hundred years before the time of Christ, the translators translated the Hebrew word sheol with the Greek word Hades. The King James Version translates the Greek word Hades with the English word hell. Ten out of the eleven times that it appears in the New Testament. Most modern translations almost always leave the word Hades as just Hades, except for like one place in the ESV, and I think they did this for sentimental reasons, because, you know, Jesus says to Peter, um, he says, the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against my, my church is going to storm the gates of Hades. Sheol Hades is the realm of death. It's the realm of the Greek god Hades, who is, you know, the Roman god Pluto. In Norse mythology, it's the dominion of the Norse goddess Hel, H-E and then one L. And check this out, there, there are levels in Hades. The top level can be quite pleasant. Uh, it's even sometimes called the Elysian Fields, but the lowest level is sheer agony, that's Tartarus. You remember in Peter, he refers to Tartarus once in his second letter. Well, the Jews translated Sheol as Hades because, see, the concept of Sheol was rather similar to the concept of, of Hades. In the Old Testament, everyone, except arguably Enoch and Elijah, but including like Abraham, Moses, David, all of Israel, they all descend into Sheol upon death. And yet, Sheol can begin here on the surface of the earth. David writes, the cords of Sheol entangled me. Begins here, but continues under the earth after the body dies. And yet people that have descended into Sheol in the Old Testament come up from Sheol, like Samuel in the story of the witch of Endor, and, and also David in the Psalms. Solomon writes, there is no thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, and yet Jonah prays in Sheol for salvation. Wild. And David sure seems to think that Yahweh can descend into Sheol, for he writes this, if I make my bed in Sheol what the King James translates hell, you, Yahweh, are with me. So I hope you see that hell number one, Sheol, Hades, is a realm of death, lies, lostness, darkness, chaos, loneliness. It's the realm of lovelessness, hopelessness, and faithlessness. Sometimes people ask me, well, do you believe in hell? And I say, well, actually, nobody believes in hell. That's what makes it hell. Uh, 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 it's not having faith. It's not trusting. If you trust nothing or no one, then you see you are entirely alone. And that's the very first thing that God said is not good, which is evil. It's not good for the Adam to be alone. That's evil. So in Hades, absolutely everyone feels forsaken. Hell number one is not believing, but hell number two is uh, just the opposite. So you can think of hell number two, the eternal fire, as being over here, very different than hell number one. Remember that Peter and the prophets, they predict that our entire world, the cosmos, is going to be baptized, literally, in, in fire. In the Old Testament, Sodom's destroyed by fire, destroyed by eternal fire, and yet Sodom is not still burning. It's not still burning, and Ezekiel prophesies that it will be made new. So the fire is eternal, 
But the burning is temporal, happens in space and time. And the things that God repeatedly consumes are the sacrifices and the offerings. The fire comes down from heaven to receive them. Why? Because God hates them? No, because they're holy. And it's the fire that fills the temple with the glory of God. And Peter and Paul tell us that we're the temple. In the Revelation, John sees a lake of fire and theon, translated brimstone, but it can also equally be translated divinity. It's an adjective that can be used as a substantive. Theon comes from theos, which in Greek is God. And in the Revelation, fire is poured out on the earth from bowls that very clearly are full of the blood of the lamb, which is blood that's wine and wine that's blood, and it's all fire. Scripture says that God is a consuming fire, God is love, and God is one. So do the math and figure that one out. It means he's not part love and part fire. It means he's one hunk of hunk of burning love. That's what he is. A communion of love. Three persons, one substance. And a communion of love is called life. So the eternal fire is this communion of love that is life. It's life instead of death, truth instead of lies, the way instead of the loss, the light instead of the dark, logos instead of chaos, communion instead of loneliness. The fire is literally faith, hope, and love. That is, it's, it's the good. So you do see that although we've used one word to refer to both hell number one and hell number two, hell number one and hell number two are exact opposites. And yet they are not equal opposites, not at all. 25 years ago up at Lookout Mountain Community Church, I'd uh, preached this through most of the revelation. Everybody seemed to love it. I was utterly blown away. I think everybody was utterly blown away by how relevant and beautiful the whole thing was. And then we got to chapter 20. And it just blew the doors off the wagon. I think my wagon and everybody's wagon. 20 verse 12. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Doesn't say whether it's good or bad, just what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades, hell number one, was thrown into the lake of fire, hell number two. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, and now remember, names are written in the book of life. By whom? Not us. The Lamb, when? From the foundation of the world. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And four verses later, and death will be no more. And he who was seated on the throne said, Look, behold, I make, I'm making all things new. Now, if you have questions about the dead who die which is also us. I hope you read uh, my commentary on the Revelation. But right now, focus on verse 14. Death and hell, hell number one, death and Hades, is thrown into the lake of fire, hell number two, so they cannot be the same thing. And more than that, hell number two utterly devours hell number one. It's called the death of death, which is Life. For just a few verses later, death will be no more. And if Hades still exists, what well, goes by a different name? Because it's full of life. In other words, life just swallowed death. Like the high priest swallows the sin offering in the temple. Truth swallowed every lie. The way found all the loss. The light flooded the darkness. The logos transformed the chaos. Creation filled the desecration, the, the void, as all things were baptized in the blood of the Lamb, and the blood of the Lamb filled all things with the life of God. 
That's faith filling all faithlessness. That's hope filling all hopelessness. That's love transforming, filling, flooding all lovelessness. That's the good transforming the evil. That's grace. Grace. That's the substance of I am that I am. You see, Hades Sheol is the experience of the absence of God. And there's no place where God is not present. That's why I said experience. But there is a place where we shut our eyes and hide from his presence, right? That's our own psyches, our illusions. Hades uh, Sheol is the experience of the absence of God and who I am not. And the fire is the manifest presence of, of God who is I am that I am. Not an illusion, but reality itself. When Jesus is transfigured, you remember he becomes a man on fire. And this shows up throughout the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. He becomes a man on fire filled with the glory of God. We think of the lake of fire as hell, and it is prepared for the devils and his angels. It burns them. And it burns us when we agree with the devils, with, with evil. That's what it does, but what it is, is the manifest presence of God. And so a better name for hell number two, uh, well, I think the better name is, is heaven. C.S. Lewis wrote uh, in The Great Divorce, he wrote most eloquently about hell number, hell number one. Uh, it's, a, it's a little novel, and toward the end, C.S. Lewis is this character having a conversation with his teacher who's taken him on a, a tour of hell number one. And he asks his teacher this, are heaven and hell only states of the mind? Hush, says the teacher. Do not blaspheme. Hell is a state of mind. You never said a truer word. And every state of mind left to itself, every shutting up of the creature within the dungeon of its own mind is in the end hell. But heaven is not a state of mind. Heaven is reality itself. All that is fully real is heavenly. For all that can be shaken will be shaken, and only the unshaken, the eternal, he's quoting Hebrews, only the unshakable remains. The whole difficulty in understanding hell, Hades, is that the thing to be understood is so nearly nothing. Then can no one ever reach those trapped in that place, asks Lewis. And his teacher, who happens to be George MacDonald, answers, only the greatest of all can make himself small enough to enter Hades, into hell. It was not once long ago that he did it. Time does not work that way when once we have left the earth. All moments that have been or shall be were or are present in the moment of his descending. There is no spirit in prison to whom he did not preach. So hang on to that thought for a minute. But this is my point right now. Hell number one is like what we have, have done. That is the world that each of us constructed. It's the fallen psyche of humanity. And hell number two, that is heaven, is like the manifestation of who God is. I think it's like the psyche of God. Who, which is, who is Jesus the Christ? So, so Hades is like a temporal illusion, and heaven is eternal reality, the fire, eternal fire. But in Scripture, there's one more word that's been translated as hell. And this word is still translated as hell. So in most of your Bibles, when you read the word, if you read the word hell, it's probably this word. It's the Greek word Gehenna. And the Hebrew term Gehenom, which means Valley of Hinnom. And I've been there. I took a picture. This is a picture of Gehenna. The smoke um, comes from barbecued chicken and hamburgers, but probably not hot dogs because these are Jews uh, having a barbecue just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, Gehenna is the valley uh, at the edge of Jerusalem to the south and to the west. 
And we all know that old Jerusalem is a prophetic picture of the new Jerusalem coming down, the body and bride of Christ. It's heaven is the new Jerusalem. So if you would, picture hell number three, Gehenna, right here in the middle of, in the, middle of, this, of the stage. It's the place where heaven and hell meet, and so a better name for hell number three would be the judgment of God. Gehenna contains this place called Tophet that you'll read about in the Old Testament. It means the burning place. It also contains the potter's field where Judas hung himself. It's a place where Jews and their kings did abominable things in the Old Testament, like sacrificing their children to demon gods in unholy fire. And yet Isaiah reveals that this whole place is set on fire by the breath of God. Like a stream of brimstone, it is kindled. That's holy fire. So even though the children were offered to demons, they were received by God, who makes all things new. Jeremiah prophesies that one day this valley will be inside the new Jerusalem and holy to the Lord, the valley of dead bodies and ashes. See, God's not limited by things that have turned into ashes. Gehenna is the burning edge of the outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth, the burning edge of the outer darkness and the kingdom of God where everything is good and it is finished. Jesus was crucified just outside the city walls on the hill of the skull near the northern end of the valley of Hinnom. The wounds on the body of Christ are the burning edge of the new Jerusalem. Hebrews 9.26, he, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus is the presence of the kingdom of God and the end of the kingdom of Satan and Hades and Pluto and hell. He's the judgment of God, the judgment of God which is salvation, not endless damnation, but eternal salvation. And, and now do you see just how twisted is this lie that we so often call hell? That is the idea that there is a place where love endlessly tortures his own children. Or even allows them to be endlessly tortured by Satan as if Satan were more powerful than God. I mean, who would have ever thought of such a thing? Because of that lie... We hide ourselves in Hades, hell number one, terrified of heaven, hell number two. And so we run from the judgment of God, which is the salvation of God, which is the will and word of God, who is Jesus, the Savior. So because of the imaginary elephant in the room, we hide in hell, terrified of heaven, trying to save ourselves from the Savior, and then we tell the world that we can help them do the same. That's not just bad theology. That's, I think that's satanic. And now I need to tell you a story. Some of you have heard it more than once, and if so, I'm sorry, but after a lot of prayer, particularly for this series, I think God wants me to talk about my experience, what he's shown me. I, I've got files of quotations and experiences that other, the others have had, but I think I'm supposed to tell you about the things that Jesus has shown me, which, which took me back to the Bible and made me read it in an entirely different way. About 30 years ago, in answer to a prayer that I prayed, I met a friend who had been ritually abused for decades. And as Susan and I prayed for her, I began to see things that just utterly rocked my world. And now, um, I'm not scared of hell number one, Hades. At least not in the way that I used to be, because, you know, I think I've been there. And let me tell you, it's absolutely terrifying. But, but I don't think I, I'm scared of it so much because I discovered that Jesus is already there. He's just hidden. He's, he's hidden until the eyes of our heart are opened and we're ready to surrender to grace and call on his name. 
And I'm, I'm also not afraid of hell number two, at least not in the way I used to be afraid. I can't tell you the number of times in prayer when I've just begged God to pour out his eternal fire upon the room. And when he does, oh, it comforts us and it burns evil like fire. And I'm not afraid of hell number three, the judgment of God, at least not in the way I used to be afraid. Now, I have to clarify, it can hurt. <laughs> it can really burn my ego, but I also know that it sets me free. Why? Because the judgment of God, it turns out, is the deepest desire of my heart. Well, about 16 years ago, just after the sanctuary began, and I'd been defraught for refusing to publicly confess that there was a group of people that God couldn't save and a group of people that God didn't want to save, our friend went on a trip out of the country, and on the trip she witnessed some natives sacrificing a goat in a fire. It triggered a set of memories in her that filled her with fear, which caused her to run into the darkness and surrender to lies that allowed a host of evil entities back into her soul, entities that we had spent 14 years praying to get rid of, but having uh, now returned to the state, she was desperate, and so we prayed together in, in the basement. And in the prayer, we returned to the campfire which for her had turned into the outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. And, and I asked her, this is what we would do, I asked her for, to look for Jesus in that place, as I had done for years, to look for Jesus in places that, and this is wild, but my wife would also see in visions. Well, this night, she looked and looked and looked, and she couldn't find him. I'm going, God, what is going on here, Jesus? And then I had this thought. I said, well, did you look in the fire? That was the one place she had been too fair, terrified to look. So she did for a while, and then after a while she, she muttered, um, he's standing in the fire. He asked her to surrender something after a while that she was holding on to, and she did. And, and then she said, she said this, but, but I'm still so angry. Now, I think she may have been Angry at herself and angry at me too, maybe, but she was definitely angry at Jesus, the judgment of God. Angry that he had let this universe of pain ever exist in the first place. And I imagine you've been angry too. And then I said, well, I'm angry too. And I was really angry that although I had done everything I thought Jesus had asked, my entire world, the one that I had spent like three or four decades building, he had just allowed it to be shattered like a vase that you would drop on a cement floor and watch break into a million pieces. And then Susan said, I'm angry too, because it wasn't just my world that had shattered. Finally, I, I said to both Susan and our friend after we had told them all these things, <laughs> how angry we were. I said, well, what's Jesus doing now? And they said, well, he's still standing in the fire with his hands outstretched as if he wants us to join him. And so I said, okay, let's just join him in the fire. And so we stood up and we held hands together and uh, closed our eyes. And I think I prayed for us something like, Jesus, just baptize us with your fire. And we stood there for a while, felt to me like nothing was happened, happening. And, and finally, I, I said to my friend, I said, well, what do you see? And she said, you're ugly. And I said, I, I know, I know, but I mean in the vision. And Susan and her both said, yeah, yeah, we're talking about in the vision. You're like all burned up and charred and, and you, you, you look like a pile of, you look like a pile of, of ashes. We all do. We're all ugly. So we just stood there for a while. And then my wife finally said, Peter, why don't you ask Jesus to blow on us? I did, and then he did, and then I heard my friend gasp in absolute wonder. She just started screaming, I'm not fragile, I'm not fragile, I'm not fragile, I'm not fragile. 
Because when he blew on us, all the ashes blew away. And underneath the dust and ashes were revealed these beautiful, bright, white, indestructible, eternal beings. The eternal beings in each one of us that somehow were us. A, a person who could not be shaken. A person who could not be destroyed. And so we ought to ask, what was destroyed by that fire? Well, you see, I think it was what each of us thought that we had done. Which was to create ourselves as best we could in the image of God with our knowledge of good and evil. When, in fact, the thing we had each created was a prison for ourselves, a body of sin and death, hell number one. If you don't surrender it here, on the surface of the earth, it appears that you can get trapped in it under the earth after your body dies for a time. But only for a time, because time itself comes to an end in the lake of fire, hell number two. So what's the good news? Well, you don't have to wait for the end, for the end has already come to you. The thing that was burned away was hell number one, and it was burned away by hell number two, the manifest presence of Jesus. So the experience of the absence of God was burned away by the manifest uh, presence of God. And that experience, you see, was hell number three. It, it burned me and then set me free to be who it is that I truly am. No longer I who live, but somebody else. So why did I choose to walk into the fire? Well, because the fire had already descended into me. The indestructible life in me is Christ in me, that indestructible life. That is faith, hope, and love in me, and that is the judgment of God. Rising from the dead in the tomb of old me. And now I hope you realize that I'm not just talking about theology and eschatology and freaky weird experiences that are hard to relate to. I'm talking about every moment of every day in which you make a good decision. Or to say it the other way around, every moment of every day in which the good decision of God makes you. If you make decisions fearing the judgment of God, you make decisions away from the judgment of God. And with all your decisions, you create hell number one. But if you make your decisions trusting the judgment of God, you make your decisions in the presence of the judgment of God, the presence of God, and discover that the judgment of God is making you. And making decisions in his temple, which is you. All of those decisions are faith and hope and love in you, Christ in you. So what can you do? Because that's what people go, well, what can I do? What can you do? Nothing. Nothing apart from the word of God in you. But when you hear the word of God in you, you'll begin to speak the word of God to others and the word will accomplish that for which he was sent. Salvation. Whenever I actually do something, it's because the word of God has descended into my darkness, taken me by the hand, and said, Peter, let's go, and we walked into the fire. And whenever you actually love someone, it's because the word of love has descended into your darkness and walked you into the fire. And whenever you, you, you do actually love someone, the word of God in you is walking you into that someone else's darkness where you are taking them by the hand and talk and together you're walking into the fire the judgment of God which is God in other words love understand Jesus the word of God descended into Hades descended into me and Susan and our friend and he took us by the hand using our own hands and he walked us through judgment and into the kingdom where we discover that each one of us is not what we have done but we are what God has done. And even who it is that I am is, we're his body. That's what he did. 
And that, by the way, is what he's doing right now. For having descended into this world of death, darkness, and lies on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, the word of God took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. And now the evil one will tell you to run from this. The evil one will tell you that Jesus died to save you from the judgment of God. Because it's evil. Why? I mean, just look what God did to Jesus. That's what he'll tell you. Tell you that Jesus died to save you from the judgment of God, but Jesus is the judgment of God, which saves you from yourself. And all the lies that uh, the evil one has convinced you to believe in order to construct a world without love. This is the revelation of love. This is the word of God from the bosom of the Father. This is the heart of our dad. So if you're struggling with the concepts that I was talking about this morning, theology that is, um, just pray this prayer that Jesus commanded us to pray and then think about it. Pray our dad. Pray our father. And even if you had a bad dad, earthly dad, I think you'll begin to understand because you can only know a bad dad because you long for a good dad. And I had a good dad. But you know what? Sometimes he would say stuff like this to me. He'd say, Peter, you may not hit your sister and you may not sass your, your mom, even if you think they deserve it. And I don't know whether they did it or not, but, but no more TV for you. You're going to your room and you're going to sit there by yourself and you're going to think about it. That's hell number one. Separation from my dad. Sometimes he'd put me there, sometimes I'd put myself there. And what made it worse was my knowledge of hell number two, the knowledge of my dad, because I really loved my dad, and deep inside I always wanted to be with my dad. He was my heaven at the age of seven. And yet the worst of all was when he'd come sit next to me on my bed after I'd been sent to my room, and we'd have a talk. That was hell number three. Judgment. Judgment. His words were always grace, but sometimes they really stung. And then they'd, they'd lead me to tears, but the tears would turn eventually into laughter, and then he'd just hold me on his lap, wrapped in a big old hug, and in this way he shaped me in his image, and you see, that was the plan all along. And we'll talk about that next week. I had a good dad. Not a perfect dad. But even on the very worst of days, I'm absolutely sure that he never, ever, ever, ever even wished the smallest bit endless conscious torment on me. This is just a tragedy that some of us religious folks have actually taught people that endless conscious torment is the judgment of God our Father, when in fact the judgment of God our Father is to give you this. His very own heart, from the bosom of the Father, the will of God. Dark cups are wine, light cups are juice. They're both the life of God our dad. Amen? Amen. So uh, we're calling this series Gospel, New Ancient Foundations. And talking about... Uh, how it is that we preach the gospel um, because maybe we haven't actually been preaching it. And in doing that, the first thing that I think we've got to do is to deal with that giant imaginary elephant in the middle of the room. And so I want you to get this, okay? So uh, this is what we just said. Number one, there is no endless conscious torment in Scripture. Number two, there are three concepts that refer to as hell or translate with the English word hell. 
Hell number one, Hades, Sheol. Hell number two, the eternal fire, the presence of God. Hell number three, where two and one meet, the judgment of God. And number three, the judgment of God is salvation. Never, ever hide from the judgment of God. Always run to the judgment of God. His name is Jesus, Yeshua. God is salvation. (laughs) You see, that makes a difference. Because, you know, sometimes people will be like, oh man, I think judgment day is coming. And I kind of like, I perk up. Like, are you serious? That's awesome. Because my dad's judgment is good. And that changes absolutely everything. So uh, if you need, re- I have some resources. So Sashi, th- this book, All Things New, it is about this very topic. And you can pick up a copy here. Also, though, if you're watching online and you can order it on Amazon, or you, if you go to relentless-love.org, uh, slash books, our website, you'll find uh, the book there. And down below, you can just read now. You can just download it uh, to your computer. So if you're watching online or in another country or something, you can just do that right now. Also, um, I have this commentary on the, I had a commentary on the Revelations that they sold in Barnes and Nobles and places like that, like 20 some years ago. But we preached through it again, and uh, you can also download, download that. Now we're calling it the Gospel According to Jesus. It's better than the book, um, but you can read that now and download it too if you have uh, questions. Uh, so this was just the first part of our sermon series, uh, The Gospel, New Ancient Foundations, Hell, the Elephant in the Room. Next week we'll talk about creation, did God lose control of time? And here's a spoiler, no, he didn't. So uh, that's turns out we think he did, but he didn't, so that's uh, really good news. So now by way of benediction, believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, because Jesus' name is the gospel. Amen.